Hello, I'm here today with thriller author Simon Wood. Hello, Simon. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> you may or may not see Simon's video. He's kind of in the matrix over there, but if I can figure out a way later to replace him with the giant teddy bear or something, I might do that in post-production. But for now, uh, Simon's webcam is not quite working. But anyway. Well, um, I'm in witness um, protection, so... You know. <laughs> right. Well, uh, is that how you got the, that accent? Yeah, yeah, they had to put me as far away, they had to put me in the colonies, you know. Right, so you're actually, well, you're from New Jersey, so the British accent is yeah. just, uh... <laughs> it's all part of the disguise. <laughs> Here we go, Here, here's a little about Simon. USA Today best-selling author, Simon Wood is a California transplant from England. He's a former competitive race car driver, a licensed pilot, an endurance cyclist, endurance cyclist an animal rescuer, and occasional P.I., he shares his world with his American wife, Julie. Their lives are dominated by a long-haired dachshund and six cats. He's the Anthony Award-winning author of Accidents Waiting to Happen, Paying the Piper, Terminated, Deceptive Practices, and the 80 Westlake series. His latest book is Saving Grace, and his book, The One That Got Away, is currently optioned for a movie adaptation. He also writes horror under the pen name of Simon Janis. Curious people can learn more at simonwood.net. So I guess my first question is, when I was four years old, I really wanted to be a race car driver. So how did you make that happen? Um, it was, I was about 19, and I was, I actually used to street race a lot, and uh, and just go out trying to find someone who would chase me around town. And I, I worked with a woman who was a paramedic, and her husband was a fireman who cut people out of cars and they said take it off the road and i just went to a track day and um and i did it a, a lot better than i expected and and about a couple of weeks later the guy who ran the race school said uh do you want to co-own a car and compete hmm. next season and it just went from there wow so you uh, just kind of stumbled into it huh yeah, I actually wanted to do uh, rally driving, which is like off-road driving, and I found I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> and um, but track stuff, you know, circuit racing, I kind of um, wasn't too bad at. So um, I raced for about three, three, four years uh, until I, like all race car drivers, you ran out of money, and you have to come to terms with the thing of like. Because you just become a little bit of a junkie, to be honest. Mm. You start viewing everything that you've got in terms of that's a new tire, that's a new set of tires, that's that's a race entry, and I just had this thing, this agreement with myself. If I had some really bit bad crash, then you know it was time to retire. And I retired on my 25th birthday. Mm. I I destroyed my tra uh, car at. Uh, on the Grand Prix track at Brands Hatch, and went, we're going home, <laughs> hmm. and and that that was it. I came back to it a couple of times, uh, and and had other cars, but um, that sort of intense kind of three four year period was uh, when I was the most serious about it. Wow. Well, so I I do want to talk about uh, uh, um, your writing in the book you want to talk about today, but. First, I got to say that I think a couple years ago you shared on Facebook. I think probably one of my favorite memes I've ever seen. Uh, it was it was a, a picture of a Christmas tree and presents under the tree and a roaring fire in the fireplace, and it said, uh, you know, "Pro tip for parents: uh, wrap up a bunch of empty boxes as presents, and if your kids misbehave, throw an empty box into the fire." Yeah, that was uh, it was it was horrible and hilarious at the same time. Well, I think I've always been a fan of that thing on uh, uh, the Jim Handy quote things that were on uh, Saturday Night Live mm -hmm. when he said, uh, take the kids to some sort of burnt down thing and tell them it's Disneyland. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just a riff off of that. That's awful. Anyway, so Simon, tell us a little bit about you and your writing. Um, I'm... Uh, I've been writing thrillers about 20 years now, um, published for about 16 or so. Um, I think the best way to describe what I do is um, I tend to write about ordinary people who are who are in extraordinary ex circumstances for the first time. Um, uh, a critic once said I write first-time heroes, and I thought that was a mm. good 
a good way of um, summing it up. So my people aren't professional crime fighters or um, crime preventers. They're just usually people who are just walking off the street. Um, it was one of those things I didn't really know at the beginning what I was writing. And um, I suddenly realized that um, I was such a fan of Hitchcock and I suddenly had this thing that I had this sort of epiphany that I liked what he did with that sort of thing of, of, of someone being tested and it exposes human frailty, weaknesses, um, and things like that. And I, I thought, I, went, I think this is my thing. Hmm. I kind of feel that that's the thing I can write about. Cause I think at the beginning I wanted to write like Raymond Chandler. Mm-hmm. And everything just came off as pastiche, and 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 it didn't quite work. But I kind of felt um, because I think I've had so many kind of odd life experiences where it's like, well, that kind of came out of nothing, and I've kind of drawn off of that. And I think that's that's the flavor of the books. I've read your book, uh, the one that got away a couple of years ago, and I very much enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. But today, we're talking about your favorite thriller, and the book that you told me you wanted to talk about is Velocity by Dean Koontz. So um, can you give us like a little teaser or primer, uh, just a spoiler-free synopsis uh, about what Velocity is about? Yeah, um, it's about a, a bartender called uh, Billy who's kind of um, – he's kind of hiding from life. Um, he was a writer and he did have like a bright future, but he has, he literally does have a girlfriend in a coma and he's kind of retreated into be having this quiet life in, in Napa, California. And, um, just one day he just finds a note, um, that just says, um, if, if you don't take this note to the police, I will kill a lovely blonde school teacher. If you do, Instead, I will kill an elderly, active in charities uh, woman. Uh, you have six hours to decide. The choice is yours. And he goes through these various trials with this unknown killer who's kind of singled him out. Uh, and it all sort of like leads to that there's a, there is a reason for why he has been selected um, for these sort of like... Uh, damned if he does, damned if he don't kind of challenges, where he's got to make this moral uh, decision over someone who's going to... who, Because it isn't the, the decision of someone who's going to live or die, it's going to be who dies. And I just thought that was uh, an amazing um, concept for a book. And, and the, the book just, once it starts at the beginning, you kind of get the introduction to Billy, it just goes off, and there's just no stopping it. It, and it... lives up to his title. <laughs> And it sounds quite a bit like what what you describe that you write, which is an, an ordinary person in an extraordinary circumstance. Because it doesn't sound like this this Billy guy is ex special forces or an ex marine. Or... No, he has he has no um, professional skills, which is kind of what I kind of relate to. But I think it also I ha- I have like a list of books I go, damn, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> and and this is the one, this is one of those that I went, ah, oh, I should have had that idea. <laughs> and and done that. It's just one of those that I kind of it does it does uh, strike a chord with me. So is Billy? Would you consider him to be a compelling character? Or is he's just sort of along for the ride in a, in an intriguing and intricate plot? I think you've got someone who who is haunted by life. You know, and it's one of those things when you're haunted. You know, you're making up the ghost yourself. And um, you're you're seeing him being brought out of this sort of like um, life made cave that he's made around himself. That he's like, I'm going to hide from everybody. I'm going to hide from everything. I'm not going to face anything anymore. Uh, I'm just going to be this this bartender who knows everybody's name. Mm-hmm. In, in so and and it's that thing of like this uh, experience is dragging him out. It's making him um, see the world differently. Mm-hmm. 
So I'm pretty sure I've read this book. I think I read it a few years ago, probably around the same time as I read his book Intensity, which was just a, um, an amazing adrenaline ride with like 10, 5, 10 pages of setup, and then the rest of it was just pure uh, nonstop action. And I think I read Velocity around the same time. And if I if I remember right, um, I'm going to be careful what I say here so we don't get into spoilers, but the villain does show up eventually, yes. right? Yeah, eventually you do have that standoff that he he has the uh, the face off with the with his with his nemesis, but it, you know for the majority of it, it's just a, a you know a voice that is taunting him. But he does he does have the showdown. So since we can't really talk about the villain in this book without without uh, giving away a big plot point in the book. Let me just ask you a general question about villains as a thriller writer. How how important do you think it is uh, for for a thriller to have a great and compelling villain? Um, I think it, it it is, and it's that thing that I've always been when I'm doing my own things is that it, I do believe in that thing that the villain believes they're the hero of their own story. Mm -hmm. You know whether they whether it's they've been jilted by a person or by circumstances or by life is that the, you know they're on this quest uh just as much as the hero is so if you want an entertaining uh hero i think you you also need an entertaining villain who's um you know he's basically trying to do you know achieve something as well um so I, you know, it's that thing of like you need to have their little backstory and to be able to flesh them out because I think the worst thing is is it's you know it's someone is like you know what I'm just going to be a bad guy, <laughs> and that just doesn't just doesn't work. The old mustache twirling guy who just is out for villainy um, doesn't doesn't play out. Yeah, there's definitely a fine line between making your villain relatable and compelling enough that your your reader will almost see the villain side of you. You know, the the villain will the the reader will almost relate to the villain, but not quite because you can't make your villain more likable than your hero, because then yeah, you've got uh, yeah. then you've got Breaking Bad really, where the uh, yeah the villains well, are the good guys in Breaking Bad. Yeah, you might as well just write an anti-hero if you yeah. do that. But I, I think that's the thing that you, you know, you said you read the one that got away and the, you know, the hero and villain in that is you see that the both of them have, have suffered trauma. And I've done that in other books and it's how they respond to similar um, situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I always say, you know, you could m my kind of story would be. Uh, the, you know, the hero and villain need fifty thousand dollars each. One is going to go to the bank to get a loan, and the other one's going to go to the bank with a shotgun. Mm -hmm. And you know, and then they're going to clash on that day. And and that I think that's how you want to set up your villain and hero in some respects. Nice, well said. So uh, regarding velocity, would you describe it as a page turner? And what what does a page turner mean to you? Um, I would actually. I, I I just plowed through this thing. Um, I was just engaged in it. I think it's that thing of um, I don't need time to um, process what's happening in the story to keep uh, to keep reading. It's just that thing of like I just have to know what happens next, mm. and I'm along for the ride. The same way as Billy is kind of reluctantly on a ride. I'm on a um, very much i want to follow this through and see where it goes um and it's just so tightly written there's not a lot of um like you said about um intensity it kind of like sets up pretty quick and then it is it literally is challenge 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 and it's how he how he tries to um circumvent each one so that he doesn't have to make the horrible decision for the for the two people that he has to keep um making a moral decision on and it's just something that is the way it's written that there's not a lot of um if you like internal dialogue as it were you know where this can slow the story down it's everything is in the moment and i think that's what makes um, a page turner 
Yeah, there's just something about um, opening those mystery boxes, which I, I remember reading an interview with J.J. Abrams where he talked about that. And I don't know if he coined the phrase, but he talked about that's that's how you how you keep an audience interested is you ask a question, you open a mystery box, and then you you make them suffer and wait to find out what's on the inside of it. And that's how you keep people – so you keep eyeballs on the screen is what he was talking about. But I think that's how you keep people turning the pages is you – ask them questions that they have to know the answers to. And that's what drives someone to stay up way past their bedtime to, to read just one more chapter. Yeah. And I, I just think there's also, if, especially with that kind of story set up for, um, for velocity is that you aren't given, um, you're not given the character time for reflection. So you're not given the reader time for reflection because there's a there literally is a, a ticking clock with every one of these um challenges that he faces you know you've got you know five hours to solve that and he's trying to you know warn both parties and it and this sort of thing there isn't that time to um you know sit down and the character because i think if you're in a panic which you know essentially this character's in a panic for 300 plus pages um you aren't thinking this reminds me of the time when i was a child and my first day. you know you don't you can't go into that it literally is i've got to get to this place you know the action becomes tunnel vision yeah um in that you don't let things in and if you want to if you want a little bit of a, uh, a cheat to it is um it's, if you have a page turn it stops the reader from seeing the cracks hmm because it's like you know you're ripping through it and they might think about it after they've done but but you've already sent them on the roller coaster ride. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it like that. So compared to the entire breadth of thriller history out there, what is the one thing that makes Velocity stand above all the others that made it the one you wanted to talk about today? Um, I wanted to talk to it because I thought it was a lesser known book of Dean Koontz. Um, it was obviously a, a, a bestseller, but I think if, if you ask people name a Dean Koontz book, I don't think they would name this one. Hmm. Um, and the other one is that it was the, the, the um, I wrote a thing for Writer's Digest many years ago uh, about the elements of a thriller and or suspense. And one of them is dilemmas. And this is the ultimate dilemma book because everything is um, do this and this will happen. Do something else, and something else will happen. And normally, it's you know, it's the, you know, if you can diffuse the situation, everybody walks away. But in this one, it was the ultimate sort of like bad thing, bad thing option. And I think that was the thing that kind of hooked me is that there wasn't, uh, you know, people are dying because of Billy's decisions. Uh, you know, someone else might be doing it. But his decisions are costing lives. And that's a hard thing for a character to live with. Yeah, it sounds like exactly what uh, what Sean Coyne describes in the story grid where he talks about he called it the best bad choice that you have exactly. to make your hero yeah. face. And this sounds like the very definition of that where Billy is having to make these horrible decisions one after the other. And, and um uh, it would be really difficult to choose which of those bad choices is the best one. Does this person die or this person? There's really no way to win there. So yeah, I can imagine. I, my favorite um, Hitchcock movie is Shadow of a Doubt, which is about uh, a teenage girl who's named after her Uncle Charlie, who is idolized by the family, who you find out is a serial killer. And she basically is the only one in the family who realizes this. And then he realizes that she realizes, and then they have this battle to the death. But the film ends on this sort of thing of like, Oh, you know, uncle Charlie is disposed of as a serial killer. Um, but the girl has to live with the, with the thing that she will destroy her mother and her family. If she tells her that, you know, that the, the family idol is a murderer. Hmm. And that is, uh, and that is probably it's my favorite Hitchcock movie. But that is probably the cruelest story out of everything he ever made, because it's that thing of you kind of watch it and go, oh, happy ending, and then you sit down and you go, no, it's not. <laughs> she has to live with this shit forever. Mm -hmm. 
either uh, if she destroys her family or she has to bottle up this monster that she is aware of. And I've always thought it's like the interesting story would be what is young Charlie, the girl, doing in 20 years? And I kind of have that same sort of situation with Billy. It's like, what is Billy going to be like today? Mm-hmm. After all the carnage and the, the bad guy is caught, you know, what is the ramification that, it, you know, that is to the way he sees the world? Because, uh, you know, some of this stuff doesn't wash off. Yeah, also, uh, spoiler alert for a 50-year-old movie, in case anyone should have probably yeah. said that before, but... Uh... It's it's fifty years old, fifty or sixty years old now. So I think um, the statute of limitations has probably passed yeah, when it comes yeah, yeah. to uh, spoiling Hitchcock movies. So one more general question about thrillers: What do you think makes a thriller a thriller? Um, for me, I think it's it's again it's sort of like the mental setup I have for it was when I wrote this thing for Writers Digest. I always think of thrillers as preventative and proactive whereas mysteries are reactive um, and a mystery that the crime has happened you know uh, mm-hmm. you know whatever the worst thing is happened is happened on on page one and the rest of the book is trying to solve and you know bring um, order out of chaos from whatever happened on page one where thrillers don't they're trying to uh, come to a conclusion that prevents the big thing. You know, mm-hmm. they're going to stop the assassination of the president, or they're going to stop the, you know, the bomb going off, or whatever it is, or the bank robbery from happening. Um, so they kind of, the thrill comes from: will they, won't they, um, prevent the the calamity from happening? And I kind of. Um, like that because that's the that's the thrill is you know is the worst thing ever going to happen right what uh, what book of yours would you like to talk about today um i i don't know and that's actually a good one actually <laughs> um i i'm gonna i think i'm gonna talk about terminated because i think it sort of works in a similar feeling to the the setup for this book um and Terminator is about workplace violence, um, and it was based on my wife's job, or inspired by my wife's job. She inherited a um, someone who was perceived as a violent employee, made a violent threat, and um, and that, that intrigued me. And I started looking into the situation of workplace violence, you know, of someone going postal or something like that. Uh, in the office space and I found that 20 people a week are murdered at work in the US Wow! and I kind of went that's quite a, a sobering thought um, and so I started. To, I found a government website that broke it down by gender and job type uh, you know of where the you know murders happen at work in the workplace and that became kind of fascinating and then I was find out all different things about the um the topic and uh you know and you you get either violence with the the person in the cube next to you or it's um violence from the outside coming in and um and i was just kind of fascinated by the idea of like how well do you know the person next to you Mm -hmm. and you might think you have good relations with someone but it's then you you know as a conflict arises then everything kind of comes to the surface so for um for terminated it's about a woman called gwen who is the boss of a guy called um stephen tarbell who um she has to he believes that he should be doing her job that he should be in charge and um she gives him uh, a bad review, his annual review, and that's the trigger that sets off this thing that he is going to now dismantle her life. Um, and for that sort of symmetry between characters, you know that um, you discover that Gwen had been abducted when she was in college and she had uh, escaped 
her killer uh, or her, uh, her potential killer and help convict him but went through that sort of like putting the victim on trial um so she's kind of reluctant to report this after um after uh, Stephen makes a physical um threat against her and then um they basically she does report it and the company employs private security to investigate and then once Stephen discovers that he then goes around uh setting up a campaign that is going to dismantle her life ruin her reputation and it, it ends up with when there's when she's got nothing left uh then it's a final showdown between the two oh well don't tell us how it ends i'm not going to <laughs> um but it was it was it all came out of what my wife was having to go through at the time and um, and the fascinating thing was, you know, I like to use Facebook and things to sort of like bounce ideas off amongst, you know, the readers and followers and stuff. And I just asked at the time, I said, has anyone worked with uh, an odd employee or had a, an incident? And it was amazing all the little pieces that came back to me, hmm. not necessarily violent, but certainly strange. Um, and I used a bunch of them you know these little interesting nuggets to um to m make part of of Stephen's character wow that sounds really interesting um that book is called terminated you can pick it up yeah. on amazon and it looks like it's in kindle unlimited so if you have kindle unlimited you can pick that up for zero dollars which is pretty yeah. nice if you're in ku um uh, all yeah, right it's on, it's on audio uh yeah it looks like it's also an audio um, do you have one narrator that you like to use or do you work with different people? Um, I, there is somebody I work with, uh, on some books. Um, he was hired to read one of my, um, books and then, um, I really liked what he did and we talked and, um, I use him on a few. Um, but usually I don't get any, uh, consultation on, on, uh, who reads the books. Mm -hmm. I, just told oh so and so is doing it but there's a couple of people i've really enjoyed and i hope they they do come back for other books or get selected to do other books nice well simon thank you so much for stopping by today to talk about velocity and telling us about terminated and uh i hope you have a great day and thanks for coming on the show man i appreciate it no worries thanks very much